Um, hello, I'm here yeah. with uh, John Caddy, and uh, today we he will talk about a discussion on dowsing theory and practice. Now, John, can you give us some information about your background? Yes, I got my PhD at London University before emigrating to Canada in 1966, where I worked as a marine biologist. In 1979, I moved to FAO Rome, where I pursued my main objective, the conservation of marine resources. How did you become involved in dowsing? My first experience with dowsing began in Sardinia through courses given by Mauro Arisu, a professional dowser. Sardinia has a remarkable early history. Many Stone Age constructions are still surviving and dowsing is used for locating well sites. Mauro, uh, a dowser, became known as a practical archaeologist since while dowsing for well sites, he uh, often found by chance ancient edifices that Stone Age people had constructed over underground water. Uh, can you describe the dowsing response and its potential? My interest was in learning how to access energy phenomena using simple methodologies. A later book, Hidden in the Words and Meaning Undetected, described my dowsing into the psychic energy of written spoken words. The dowser holds a stiff black plastic wand in this methodology, turning it away from his or her body while holding in mind a question such as, what is the energy reading for XXX? The wand is repeated, repeatedly r rotated away from the body, counting the turns until it refuses to rotate when the count gives the score. Okay. All right, dowsing provides answers in the physical or mental realms that often cannot be obtained otherwise. And divination, which includes dowsing, was widely used in the distant past. My experience suggests that at least three principles are important for success. Number one, the mental state during dowsing resembles a light meditation. Two, the dowser must be convinced that a solution exists to the problem raised, even if he or she doesn't know how to find it consciously. And the final and most important question is the question should be asked with an empty mind. Conscious thought during dowsing will block your success. The scale of energy detected by dowsing is given by the number of wand rotations shown here as colored bands which in pranic healing practice correspond to the dynamics of the seven chakras shown on the right. The black band of rationality refers to words used in the unemotional state typical of science investigations when the chakras remain unactivated. So your thoughts on our six senses and dowsing are linked to research on our prehistory. Did this lead to the conclusion that in history of our species, there was a radical change from the earlier beliefs and practices which were closely related to our sensibilities? A radical change came along with the onset of abstract thought by the ancient Greek philosophers. Although history urges us to believe that our intellect evolved from simple to complex, the new domination of uh, logical thought in the left brain hemisphere blocks our senses and our intuition. And intuition e e corresponds to uh, the word intuition corresponds to 12 rotations of the wand. And that process is located in the right hemisphere. Could it also be that our early skills and sensibilities as humans were eliminated during our education? And is there still a close link between our six senses and our mental skills today? 
The thinking process in the ar archetypal mind must have differed considerably from ours. A quote from Carlos Castaneda's book, The Power of Silence, expresses this better than I can. His Don Juan commented that inside every human being was a gigantic dark lake of silent knowledge which each of us could access. And Castaneda sensed that two separate parts are within my being. One is extremely old, at ease, indifferent. It is dark, heavy, and connected to everything else. The other part is light, new, fluffy, and agitated, alone on the surface and vulnerable. This is the part with which I look at the world. Yes. Uh, are you implying that there is an information source or compendium available to us in the universe? Yes, uh, different philosophers have expressed the idea that a hidden reservoir of knowledge exists in the universe, referred to by different names, such as the Akashic Records, a massive cosmic, a massive cosmic library where everything is catalogued. Anecdotes suggest that access to such an information storehouse was granted to famous scientists such as Albert Einstein and Nikola Tesla and many others who have originated new concepts. So is such a Celestian memory bank essential to your interpretation of the mechanism of dowsing? Yes, I believe that to successfully douse unknown information, as I'm going to demonstrate, you must be linked to such a cosmic information source. This has important philosophical consequences. Rather than believing that matter is dominant in the universe, it is more reasonable to assume that the universe is a composite of energies, or perhaps even more fundamentally, that information and a shared consciousness are the basic building blocks. If such a mental nexus has been recording the discoveries of all intelligent species in the 12 billion years since the Big Bang, many of our so-called discoveries may have come from copying ideas stored there by earlier intelligences. These often come by inspiration or in dreams. Thus, Nikola Tesla was walking one evening with a friend while reciting a poem when the design for an alternating current generator came into his mind, complete in all its details. So is human intelligence compatible with this cosmic reality? Uh, in two, uh, 2013, I described features of the ancient Huna, Huna philosophy of Hawaii as explained by Max Friedem Long in 1948. They are holy men described the human mind as made up of three separate components, the subconscious, the conscious mind, and a less frequently present higher mind. This last uh, superior being, who could also be called our guardian angel, can interrogate the cosmic mind and pass the information on to our subconscious during his occasional visits. Here it may be accessed by the conscious mind in dreams and visions. This idea on the different, different roles of the two brain, brain hemispheres offers a useful vision of brain functioning during dowsing. A new methodology related to dowsing is referred to as remote viewing and is a practical application of our paranormal senses. It's very similar to dowsing and with training allows you to focus attention on events at distant space time locations. This skill was perhaps rediscovered during the Cold War, allowing trained mental, mental observers who we could refer to as spies to access events in distant in time and space. James Lovelock's proposal is that there is an overall planetary intelligence Gaia of which all living things form a part. Gaia is an en energetic entity wrapped around this planet and she seems to fit in with my experience that there is a constant mental continuum supporting effective dowsing. 
the tribal shamans of our distant ancestors probably had their own version of remote viewing that they used to help survive the ice age or dowsing uh, by locating uh, remotely uh, late locating remotely herds of game. Could their animal paintings on cave walls have helped them when remote viewing to find their prey? This seems like a possible mechanism. Yes, yes. Uh, the, the Huna vision of Long is that the mind exists as three independent entities. The subconscious, the lower face in this drawing, accesses past memories coming from the environment and from the higher mind. The higher mind is envisaged uh, by the Huna as a benevolent Janus-faced entity with male-female characteristics who can ha access cosmic information sources. It provides information to the subconscious and the conscious mind may access this information in dreams or meditations. The essential role of the right hemisphere in dowsing is implied in this diagram. The left hemisphere should be turned off to avoid uh, blocking the flow of energy and information to the subconscious. One equipment-free method of dowsing doing this more explicitly is used in pranic healing, where hung, hang spacing reflects the inherent energy of the concepts. Thus, uh, this form of dowsing provides, uh, the, the, the normal form of dowsing we've been describing with the rotating uh, uh, wand provides quantitative data on ki or prana and reflects the expansion of the dowser's aura in response to the energy of what is being doused. This uh, other method here uh, is essentially uh, dependent on the expansion of the aura uh, in, in response to the uh, questions being asked. Can you tell us something more about pre-Christian Europe and shamanism? Well, Sardinia is fairly typical here, although it, it has a, it's an extremely well-developed uh, pre-Christian uh, 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 evidence of, of, of uh, the presence of human beings. So finding water was always a priority. Underground water temples were constructed millennia ago, and a tradition of dowsing was developed to locate underground water. Before the classical age even started, the skills of geomancy were linked to Earth Mother belief systems. But the high ground energy of some Christian churches may come because they were built on older sacred sites of previous religions. These sites may reflect geological faults or under, underground water reinforced by the psychic energy of past repetitive ceremonies. The physicist Tiller reported that experiments in chemistry or physics, while meditators are focused on them, give different results. He proposed that we live in four dimensions, but the universe contains seven other hidden dimensions. So like a person in a virtual reality suit, we may have access to these other realms when we are dowsing. <clears throat> So are you proposing that perceiving energy flows in nature was influential in some early human culture? Yes, and the potential of mental, dowsing, uh, mental voyaging is also illustrated when you encounter spirals on rock art. Such ground chakras suggest that spirit voyaging was common in early cultures. Ancient philosophies in China, India, and among the Incas included the belief in the importance of psychic energy and its presence in the world. The Gaia theory of Lovelock, for example, is ba based on widely coordinated planetary processes compatible with such a planetary energy field. Recent observations show that global anomalies in random number generators, which have been picked up in coinciding in time, time with shocking events such as the Twin Towers disaster, have raised the idea that Gaia was the mediating influence. Do you see a close connection between energy fields 
in nature and those in human body. The spiraling chakras in our bodies underlie our relationship to vital energy. Only a few chakras are active in people who are obsessed with material pursuits. In fact, the key word for sensitives in 2007 was embedded. We are all embedded in the aura of Gaia, a stratum of heavy energy lying over and in the Earth's surface, which holds memories of past emotional events at a given locality. This Gaia field is coextensive with our personal aura. Hence, we can be potentially aware of psychic phenomena. However, after materialism became dominant, nature has become a natural resource and extensive damage is evident whenever nature is considered simply a natural resource. Can you provide us with some ideas on the energy embedded in the language we use? Uh, <clears throat> method is used, uh, methodologies used by uh, current investigators of language, such as the semantic differential, were developed to measure people's conscious reactions to stimulus words and concepts on a bipolar scale as shown uh, uh, below. This scale attempts to display uh, emotion quantitatively as developed by a uh, conscious ju judgment of interviewed uh, persons. And you can see uh, yes. uh, in the second diagram that there are blocks of uh, emotions that according to their study show up together uh, as having similar energies. Okay. But these uh, these have been uh, based on, on conscious uh, uh, evaluation by a group of people. This uh, graph here shows uh, the number of rotations of the wand for a series of emotions, the same ones that were shown in the previous diagram. And they start with the top uh, area, uh, hope, love and happiness, uh, giving a rotation of around 30 and drop through uh, a series of positive emotions, amazement, joy, uh, arriving at uh, longing, loneliness, pride, depression, regret that are not particularly positive, distress, sadness, lust and worry, which are uh, re relatively negative, uh, and then arriving at hate, disgust and shame at a rotation of about two to three. Now, uh, the only difference with the previous uh, study is that uh, my f my finding for lust uh, is that it is a negative uh, 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 emotion like sadness and worry and not uh, it doesn't belong with the hope love and happiness uh, where it was shown in the previous uh, example okay the first action of a dowser is to is to self calibrate to, to ask the subconscious for a score in the absence of emotions. Seven to eight rotations are the usual response in emotionally neutral environments. This range is referred to as the band of rationality, since logical judgments are more acceptable, are more accessible in an emotionally neutral environment when the chakras are inactive. Word or phrase scores that exceed seven to eight rotations imply a higher level of energy, or if they fall below it, imply a depressed mental state. One interesting discovery is that words yielding scores around neutral values are characteristic, characteristic of scientific text. Words such as rational, logical data uh, are, are examples. The practical implication of this observation is that science avoids vocabularies with high energy scores, since they, these may alter the judgments of the researcher due to the emotional or spiritual overtones they uh, lend to the uh, results. <clears throat> this is curious, uh, since using high scoring words such as inspiration uh, with uh, a, a rotation of 12 of the, of the wand, may call into question existing axioms and could lead to new perspectives. 
in this figure, uh, the lower graph is the energy distribution in an ordinary uh, uh, conversation or in a literature. So we have a range from zero to 40 uh, of word values. Single words on the second line are higher value terms often used in, in literature, but the small histogram on that second line contains words sampled from science texts showing a, a reduced uh, range of energy uh, values. And when we go to the top line, you see uh, scores for divinities or famous persons. And what I found uh, rather uh, strange here was I got very high scores for uh, old uh, divinities such as Venus, Apollo, Zeus, Aphrodite, Aphrodite, where I have absolutely no uh, particular interest in 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 this uh, religious uh, uh, conventions. So what what it does imply is that these values have remained in in the uh, cosmic uh, uh, database uh, for a very long time and have not degenerated in values. Okay. Have you attempted to characterize situations in the physical world such as by water dowsing? Uh, I can detect the underground water, but a more interesting experiment was that when I doused the pranic energy of the names of the planets and moons in the solar system. A database in Wikipedia lists solar systems objects by size. This provides their distance from the sun in astronomical units and the diameters of planetary and lunar bodies. It provided a test of my dowsing ability in asking for the levels of pranic energy of these bodies, then expressing them as a function of their size and distance from the sun. <coughs> Before each dowsing, I asked for the level of pranic energy associated with the name of each body. And from here, you can see that the lowest uh, value was Mercury and the highest uh, was Jupiter. Uh, Pluto and the Sun and our Moon are also relatively low energy planets. Uh, and the Earth, uh, and the uh, gas uh, giants uh, ha have uh, relatively high values. <coughs> The analysis consisted of ranking the planetary bodies by size and hand fitting a curved line as a possible relationship. The dowsings were done with an attitude of indifference to the results, testing one name after the other with a brief pause between them. What emerged from this exercise is a general rise in energy reading with increasing planetary or moon diameter. Scores also increased with distance from the sun and the distant large uh, gaseous planets are the highest scoring. The Earth, Venus and Mars <coughs> showed uh, similar intermediate values. A low score for the Sun and Mercury may reflect the ancient idea that subtle energy, such as prana, does not coexist with high levels of conventional energy. The analysis consisted of ranking the pl planetary bodies by size and hand fitting a curved line as a possible relationship. The dowsings were done with an attitude of indifference to the results, testing one name after the other with a brief pause between them. What emerged from this exercise is a general rise in energy reading with increasing planetary or moon diameter. Scores also increased with distance from the sun and the large gaseous planets Jupiter, Uranus, Saturn and Neptune are the highest scoring. The Earth, Venus and Mars showed similar intermediate values. The Sun and its closest planet Mercury and the furthest planet Pluto are the lowest scoring bodies for prana. A low score for the Sun and Mercury may seem, may seem strange but reflect the ancient idea that subtle energy such as prana does not coexist readily with high levels of conventional energy. 
<clears throat> these two graphs show uh, very uh, clearly how uh, a, a simple uh, line can be drawn through the scores uh, of any, uh, rotations of the wand against distance and diameter of the body with, with certain exceptions. And these plots uh, uh, give you uh, some idea of, of why this is not a totally uh, random process, uh, the dowsing uh, of these, these planetary bodies. It seems to reflect something is, that is going on. So we need to look more, more readily into this. And this is the, the value, this is the graph, including also the moons of the uh, solar system. There are many moons in the solar system, and some of the uh, moons, Triton, Eo, Ophelia, and strangely enough, even Phobos around Mars, uh, are well above the uh, general trend of the uh, the, the, the plot of uh, pranic energy against planetary or lunar diameter. And that certainly raises some questions that we would like to be able to answer. Can you provide a tentative interpretation of the distribution of prana energy in the solar system? <clears throat> The prana dowsing exercise gives high scores for prana on moons rotating around the gas giants. This seems quite logical given the strong gravitational energy involved, and Perkins uh, believed that some moons had liquid oceans be beneath their icy surfaces. A high fluid content of a planet or moon in such a strong gravitational field would surely contribute to mass movement within it and hence to the generation of pranic energy. The high scores for prana given by the gas giants confirm this. Two, subset, two subsets of moons have particular characteristics that should be associated with high prana scores, and this proved correct, with scores that vary from two to five times the neutral level. The first was that moons are speculated, that moons that are, have oceans beneath their surfaces were speculated to be high energy. The, here we have Triton, Callisto, Europa, Titan, with very high levels of uh, pranic energy. Uh, one might wish that these high scores were due to the presence of life, but more probably they are a result of tidal flexing, the enhanced movement of liquids below the moon's surface due to the strong gravitational interaction these moons have with their huge mother planet. Gravitational stresses cause internal flexing and hence heating of the moon, and this is the basic cause for surface oceans and in some cases volcanic eruptions. So if you want to investigate whether a high planet score is specifically due to tidal flexing, we should look at the scores for the moons closer to their home planet, where the gravitational pull is most extreme. Some, some examples are given in the second table here, and uh, they're ranked by the uh, prana score they give, such as Eo, uh, Triton, Charon, Phoebus, whereas the moon, which doesn't have any liquid components that we know, uh, it shows very low scoring. I'm not assuming here that the, the scores are evidence for life forms present. Data on this question are not available. Prana scores can be more adequately explained where a high prana, prana reading leads to dynamic behavior and matter under a gravitational influence. An overall conclusion from this short experiment is that dowsing accesses distant objects in time and space in a manner analogous to distant viewing. And this is a case where Dowsing makes use of a cosmic information source. What can you tell about the earlier methods of investigation in the mystical schools? The inability of science to explain many features of the universe, such as the nature of dark matter, the origin of life, the evolution of DNA and the existence of intelligence 
extraterrestrials suggests that a means of investigation compatible with high energy levels should be used. The philosopher Popper concluded that progress in science depends on the ability to refute a proposition, i.e. to apply skepticism, a low scoring word with only five rotations, <clears throat> and discard concepts disagreeing with existing theory. Thus, skepticism may su suppress inspired thought, that is, uh, uh, thought inspiring 12 rotations of the wand, uh, and therefore blocking the use of uh, new axioms of thought. Thus, problems involving high scoring spiritual terms are close to impossible to solve for science as we know it, since they, requ they require us to work within a higher energy framework. Subjective science involves studying ki, prana, or orgone, the variables missing from the scientific vocabulary. And this has been used to investigate uh, the two real placebo effects in medicine, healing by prayer and telepathy, while ensuring these investigations are still based on quantitative data with adequate controls, as this method of dowsing permits. <coughs> The best clues in this subject area are found in the human genome. One of its discoverers, Francis Crick, claimed that the high complexity of DNA means that it has not had time to evolve on Earth by chance alone before the earliest fossils began to be laid down. This implies that uh, it was evolved uh, on another planet than, uh, human, than uh, on Earth. And the recent discovery of artificial metal microspheres above the stratosphere containing uh, uh, organic material suggests that seeding new planetary ecosystems from space by directed panspermia has occurred, i.e. they were guided by earlier extraterrestrials. This radically changes the game of origins and is a probable mechanism for how life forms emerge on our planet. As Sitchin discovered from Sumerian writings, supplementary interve in interventions by advanced extraterrestrials also encourage the development of human intelligence. You can see my book on did extraterrestrials bring us to intelligence on our planet for further details on this. How can a return to a study of mother nature help us reconcile science and spirituality. Our original belief system, animism, saw nature as the great spirit and the landscape as her expression. The modern equivalent of this ancient view is found in James Lovelock's revival of Gaia, our planetary superorganism. This spiritual entity kept the world fit for life over millions of years before we came along but now has to struggle against our massive interventions. In particular, the cause of climate change is mainly due to us favoring the carbon-based industries which control our economy. Maintaining our dependence on burning carbon products has led to the extinction of many species and environments. I see that our failure to conserve the biosphere stems mainly, however, from modern society's lack of a spiritual awareness of Mother Nature or Gaia. According to McKenna, the practices of primitive man, including dowsing, provide clues to our potential psychic capabilities. But if our nervous system evolved in the hunter-gatherer phase before literature and logic, is this why there is such an actual complexity in the human brain? Language and social organization are usually considered responsible for this, but perhaps before these even arose, primitive man fed our nervous system with much wider sensory inputs. Rather than seeking something new then, revisiting old ways of knowing could be profitable, and this is why the shamanic revival and dowsing are so interesting. Do you have some personal conclusion on vital energy and dowsing? In our search for a theory of science that also incorporates the natural world, the following, axiom, the following axioms emerge from our, our discussion today. We are embedded in Gaia's energy field, which varies geographically. That's the first one. 
The second one is the boundaries of our memory are uncertain. Our minds are not confined by the skull since the chakras, through the chakras we have access to other realms. There are mental fields on this planet, Gaia, and in the universe, which store outputs from all its intelligent inhabitants. The cosmic field is an information storage media that can be accessed by the higher mind through meditation, distant voicing, voyaging, or by dowsing. Gaia's field links us to each other and to other living forms in a geographically differentiated information source. Through this information source, we may become acquainted with concepts unrelated to our previous experience. Okay, thank you now for your attention. Well, uh, thank you a lot, John, for uh, this beautiful uh, uh, description and introduction. Uh, your um, contribution will be uh, available also as a, a paper that can be downloaded and there will be also the references that uh, you, you have added to the paper so people can uh, go more in detail uh, in this subject. Uh, well, uh, thank you a lot again and uh, I hope you will uh, find another circumstance to participate to this conference, uh, permanent conference on life energy.